Welcome to the House of I podcast with your host Daniel and Jaron. Today our guest is Michael Sinclair. What's going on, bud? What's up, guys? How's it going? Hey. Oh, nothing much, man. Like I said, this is uh, our second one today, so you know we're feeling pretty uh, conversational right now. And uh, <laughs> all right, I, uh, I definitely just woke up from a nap, so uh, <laughs> I got my cup of coffee here. With Dwight Schrute on it that yes. says this man is a pervert. So <laughs> Does it? Yeah. How apropos. <laughs> or un. <laughs> <laughs> but uh but yeah, man, thank you for uh for coming on and doing this. Uh obviously we've met already and uh I guess to start things off, uh I don't know, what is there anything that you wanted to plug before we get into some conversations? No, nope, not at all, man. Okay, I'm not. I'm not the plugging type. No. Nope. I tell you what, guys. Uh, hit subscribe below. Hit like if you like the page. Go ahead and give that subscribe <laughs> button a pow. Hell yeah! See, we go. I promoted you guys. There. Yeah, I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so I mean, I know that we've met already, and we've kind of talked a little bit about uh, your start. But uh, I guess like let's get into let's get into what you do. So you you film and uh, you shoot videos, and that's kind of how we've met you. And where'd you get your start doing that? Um, so I got my start doing videos for a buddy of mine, Achilles, um, five, six years ago, there's three of us, me, Achilles and our other buddy, Ryan Gallagher. And we kind of started this 79 sorcery collective. All right. I did all the visuals and they both rapped actually. Okay. And it was Achilles does. It's the only way it's the only way to describe it. Viking rap. It's like about killing people with swords and so instead of talking about a gun you know what i mean he's talking yeah. about flaming swords and viking <laughs> gods and everything so uh, they started rapping and at the time i was managing a restaurant and i was like i want to be a part of this and i had always had this kind of urge to be some type of artist but unfortunately i just don't have a steady hand i, mean, I can't sketch i can't mm-hmm. draw um and i was like you know what i think i can do photos for these guys that's how i think i can get in and be helpful to them yeah. So I, uh, I went and got a camera and started doing photos and videos for them. And uh, they are all terrible. <laughs> all the videos and photos were absolutely terrible. <laughs> I had bought a camcorder. It was a $500 camcorder. Probably wasn't the right camera. It was not the right camera I should have got. Um, and I just started learning from there. I really had no knowledge of anything. I was amazed at what an aperture was on a camera, which is like camera basics 101, you know? Right. Yeah. So uh, I started doing videos for them and I really just found myself doing it every day on my time off. I was doing it. I was editing and I realized, okay, if I'm doing this all the time, then why shouldn't I just kind of try to parlay this into an actual career? Right. You know, that's the, the goal is to do what you love, they say. And I ended up falling in love with it and then just kind of going full steam ahead, bought a new camera, the correct camera, and then just took things serious from there. Self-taught? Yeah. So YouTube. No, no college? Just, no, no college. Cool. I'm a, I am have a GED. I'm technically okay. a high school dropout. Yeah. yeah. No, <laughs> I, don't I don't think you really need college. No. For what you're doing. No, yeah. no, no. I don't. Not for... Tarantino, I mean. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Come well, on, they, a, a lot of the, the great directors say that film school ruins you, actually, you know? Yeah. Why does it teaches you, you think they, they say like teaches you bad habits or something or and, and it, it teaches you structure which in art there shouldn't be structure right it's okay to learn structure but when that structure becomes a dogma where if you don't follow a four four pattern in your music you're not western you know what i mean then yeah, you, right. you put yourselves in boxes but paul thomas anderson has a great story about when he went to film school for two weeks the first assignment was to write a one page uh script a little one page story and he didn't do it, and it was the night before, so he copied a David Mamet one-page play. And David Mamet's a famous playwright, and uh, it got a C-. <laughs> Damn. David Mamet was a, he was a playwright in New York and stuff, and that's when Paul Thomas Anderson realized that they're not, they're not the right people to grade what is good art. Right, yeah. So you go to school, and you have some classical music snob telling you what's good music, you know what I mean, or how to make right. music. Purist. Yeah, 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 and that, that I, I don't think you need, I think, go out and create, and then you make mistakes, and then when I make a mistake, I go to YouTube, and I realize, or I learn why I made that mistake, how I fucked up, you yeah. know, so that was my, my learning experience, was just doing. That's kind of the same thing for me, too, like, I learned how to play guitar, like, watching YouTube videos, like, <laughs> like, literally, I think the first song that I tried to learn was uh, Day Tripper by The Beatles, and I literally just watched someone play it like acoustically on a guitar. And it was, yeah, it was like basically the start. <laughs> and then once I got to a certain point, I was just like, 
you know what? I'll just like read tabs or something. But yeah, I really don't. I don't really know how to read music, to be honest. You know, don't need to. Yeah, it's true. You make good music. You don't need to do oh, that. Oh, that's yeah. so sweet. Yeah, <laughs> it's fine. I I think the majority of musicians nowadays don't really know how to read music. You know, yeah. that's and jazz was big for people to read music. Like Miles Davis went to Juilliard and could read music and write music because you're trying to translate to your fellow musicians right. these crazy time signatures or whatnot. Right. But you know. If you can tell him, hey, we're in this key, we're doing this, like, yeah. you don't need sheet music in front of you. I, I do think, like, the ear is, like, the most important thing Definitely. when it comes to music. Because if you have no ear, then I feel like your dynamics are off and stuff like that. Like, it just sounds very rigid instead of sounding more, like, organic and natural. You get what I mean? Yeah. So what would be, I guess, like, in, in, a, in a sense, what would be the comparison to, like, film, for example? Like, being organic and that kind of thing. Uh, I guess it, it's going again with what you're told is traditional and then trying to go against it. You know what I mean? So organic filming. So say for lighting example, you have a lighting set up here. That's the key light. The bright part is this side of your face. Yeah. Okay. In uh, cinematic shooting, you're going to shoot the shadow side of your face. Okay. For cinematic look. Right. For portrait style, corporate stuff, you look the 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 key side you film from this side because yeah. it's brighter oh okay so there's different i, I don't know if that actually is no, like a direct correlation yeah. but there is different ways of doing things right. so it's like all right i'm gonna do a corporate video but i'm gonna shoot it cinematic right so i'm gonna go over here with it or i'm gonna do so like the documentary i'm working on i shot it all corporate on the exposed side to kind of make it this uh like fake corporate look to it right. like official look to yeah. it or whatever less cinematic professional basically yeah right? yeah, yeah. And, it, and it's just those options but i thinking about music language i don't know if there's a language for film like yeah you write a script out but you don't hmm. i mean i wouldn't know a yeah. like you know there's not, a, not a direct translate you're dealing with symbols yeah right. you know like symbols on a chart uh-huh to chart out your whole song. Maybe with like Premiere Pro or like whatever programming you use, there might be like some kind of like a timeline. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, but it's not really a direct I hear you. direct translation. <laughs> yeah. That's interesting too, because like I've just recently started watching kind of like more movies again. Like the last thing I saw that I really enjoyed was uh, the second Blade Runner, which I like both of them, but the second one I saw and I I just love the visuals from it a lot. And I thought it was, like, done really artistically and stuff like that. So I – and I don't know. For me, like, personally, like, I just love – the when, when you can kind of see, like, the theme visually, like, I love that kind of thing. Like, the, you know, the color, the way it's shot and stuff like that. I don't know how it's being done, but I love that kind of shit, you know? That's the – so the, the first Blade Runner was – is known for that and still is influential in that way that the set design was the plot. Right. Was the ba the set design was as important as anything else, right. you know, so you're immersed in that story yeah. fully. And I think the second one was really good with that as well, that it is this grand scope of a film that you feel like, you know, the city, you know, right. you, you see that the waves crashing up against that wall in such a wide scope that you can feel for how big that is. Right. But th definitely the Blade Runner movies. I mean, you have to think about them. They're two, two and a half hour long. Yeah. They're not action movies. Nope. You know, yeah. is it sci-fi? I don't know. Is it just kind of? I would say so. Is it just the future? You know, it's <laughs> like like Mad Max. You know what I mean? Like it's a documentary, but just from the future type of feel. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, you know what else I love about it too is like they kind of kept that like '80s because like it's funny how in that first Blade Runner, that first one's supposed to be in 2019, right? I believe. Something. The second one's 20. 2040 40 something yeah. yeah so i think the first one is like 2019 or something like that <laughs> and i thought it's so funny that like the technology that they have in that like they tried to make it look futuristic but it still had like that 80s like technology thing to it yeah so it's yeah like, and then they kind of kept that in like the second one as well well, like, well that monitors. influenced the whole the whole new new retro wave yeah. right you know what i mean like the you get 80s cars, but just put little fenders on them, little wing tails and stuff like that, and it looks futuristic all of a sudden. That's you true, know? yeah. But it, if you got to think, in the future, those cars are going to exist. So, like, in the year 2050, the most common car is going to be made 
from the year 2040, right? Mm -hmm. Or like nobody really owns the most current thing all the time. Right. Yeah. So if you're doing a set design for a, a 1930s movie, are you going to set up the house with furniture from the 1930s? Probably not. Probably because people buy a house, they get furniture from the 1910s, 1920s. That's interesting. So there's the yeah. set design is so so detailed, but the craziest thing is it's the background. Right. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> It's, you, you, and, sorry, go ahead. No, it's just not the focus. Usually it's the actors or the focus or whatever. Yeah. But the set design is so detailed, you know, that they have whole YouTube channels where they pause it and watch frame by frame. And the Easter eggs you can see within the set design. That's just one person, like, thinking, right. what random shit can I lay around <laughs> that helps build the story, though, too. That's true. Right, it adds to it. it definitely, yeah. It's like you can almost, like, compare that to, like, the ambience in, like, an album or something, for example, where it's, like, it's not at the forefront. But if you were to take that out, it would completely change how the thing sounded. Yeah. You get what I mean? I would compare it to, like, the texture in music. Right. Yeah. You know? Right. To where it really, textures can change and affect what you're seeing, yeah. you know, or what you're hearing. Yeah. Yeah. So when you watch a movie, then, like, are you taking, are you taking that in? Are you going, like, oh, how did they do that? Or, you know, like, do you take inspiration from things like that? Uh, not the first time I watch movie stuff. I'm... I watch movies over and over and over. I've seen a bunch of movies probably 20, 30 times. Mm -hmm. I don't really get things right away at first. Like, I, I see things as this broad story, and I don't, I'm not able to pick apart details until maybe the 15th viewing, you know? I'm yeah. still seeing stuff in The Shining or still, you know, still noticing really? little things. And, yeah, I, I don't have that in-depth perception. I feel the story first. Like, I can't remember dialogue from my favorite films. Like, right. that's just not how my... I remember how... Christopher Walken held that watch up and how his face looked when he showed it in right. Pulp Fiction, you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, but as far as, as, like, set design and stuff, I mean, taking taking inspiration from other movies is it's subconscious, you know? Yeah. I mean, Tarantino definitely kind of did shit on purpose. Like, he took from Japanese and Asian films on purpose. Yeah. But as far as being influenced, I mean... You know, because I was watching one of your previous podcasts, and you were saying you were going to make a Liquid Penny song. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. But it was after you wrote the first riff. Right. You didn't intend it. Right. So that that's the same with me, is I'll write a short film or something, and then afterwards I'm like, okay, that does kind of have this Lynchian vibe to it or something. Right. But you don't really go into it with influences in the forefront of your brain. Yeah, I yeah. Because Unless and that's your you, intent, you know what I mean. Right. Because if also if you do that, then you're almost like I'm kind of. You might be ripping a little too hard off of that thing. Yeah, yeah. And that, yeah. you never want to do that. It, yeah, that makes sense. You want it to come from more of like a subconscious like. This I think so. For I'll give you a, an example of this then. Like the song that we're working on you with, for example, like that one to me was like heavily inspired by '80s music. You get what I mean? And not that it may it might not sound that way, but like. The beginning of that song, yeah, definitely the beginning of that song, I would say I was, like, going for, like, that 80s synth, you know, sound or whatnot. So I was, like, I had that intention. I wasn't pulling from a certain band or anything like that, but I was just, like, I want this song to kind of sound like it's coming from I have like, I think I when it, on the same note, like, it's not a specific thing, but it's just an abstract idea that inspires me, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, a 80s as a concept, not 80s specific moment that I'm like referencing in my head, but just like how I've absorbed the eighties through my life and right. like, wh how am I going to replicate it now? You know? Right. Broad so, strokes. So how does, so does it start with, do you hear a notes or say a chord progression, something in your head first? And then, then you say, how do I turn this into an eighties feel? Or do you say, I want to write something that's eighties feel that's an eighties feel, you know, how direct is that influence? I would what say comes first, the chicken or the egg? You know? Probably the second <laughs> thing you said for me. The like, what? The second thing you said where I just like say it plainly, like I want something to sound like the Beatles in the 60s. And it's not like a chord structure I go for first. I think it's like a tone on the piano or like a tone in the guitar. I know my buddy, he writes song titles down first. Yeah. And then we'll build a song. Too. Just he, He'll come up with a cool little like two word title and then build a song around that, you yeah. know? That's, I like that. It, idea. It's not always. Yeah. I, I guess it's not always music coming into your head first. Right. It could just be a concept, and then you figure out what musically works for that concept. I actually, I haven't done that often, but um, I definitely like that idea. I've done that. I did that one time. I don't know. If, are you familiar with uh, Metal Gear Solid? With the, the video the, game. Video game. Yeah. Yeah. So I wrote a song like 
from ba- basically going, I want to write a song like that to me, like encapsulates, you know, whatever. Is that Snake be, yeah. and stuff? Yeah. 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 yeah right. Okay. Yeah. I remember yeah. it from back in the day. Yeah. Solid Snake. Yeah. So Solid I, wrote, snake. I, wrote a, <laughs> I wrote a song like based off of that, like with that in mind. And I, I don't really think it sounds like. Was it techno y the soundtrack to that game? Was it fast paced electronic music? Depends on the one that we're talking about. Yeah, I'm going back to like. The third one that's really popular? Like, yeah, PlayStation, like 2000. Like. (laughs) I think the 2000 one was definitely like had like that that electronic 2000s vibe, like almost like a Mission Impossible kind of like sound to it, you know? But just with that, like, I feel like it's a little darker than Mission Impossible, but. Um, but, but they had like, that long intro too, with like the lady singing, and it's that's like the third one. Oh, that's yeah. okay, that's what I keep. That's what I always think yeah, of, which me. was inspired by James Bond. Like, okay, yeah, so okay, like, that makes sense. So yeah. It's like it's like a big production, you know, like an orchestra and all that shit. <laughs> and I, I love it. I think it's awesome. But uh, but no, yeah, like mine is more more on the, uh, the electronic kind of like glitchiness. So, so how about that? So I'm not a video game player. I haven't played a video game in 20 years, but video games now influencing artists and musicians like it's it's full circle it's weird yeah. like so uh what's the blade runner influence video game that just came out that's everyone's talking about that's futuristic cyberpunk uh, yes yeah, yeah. you know what i mean and it's yeah. a straight rip off from that and the, yeah. you know like it, it's kind of this video games are legitimate art now yeah. and like considered that my buddy's nerd out over god of war and red dead redemption yeah, right yeah. Interactive like it's cinematic art. man yeah, I love it. yeah it's so cool like especially that game like red dead like i was just uh i was just telling this to to my fr- to actually our old guitar player kenny i was i was telling him about this game i was like dude if, if there's a game that you would like love the visuals for it Red Dead Redemption, like they're beautiful. Like you feel like you're in, you know, in that world and stuff like that. It's gorgeous. Like, it's so cool. Like when a game does that, you know what I mean? It's, it's Hell awesome. Yeah. Definitely. Know? But yeah, not, you know, t- playing. <laughs> I don't play games as as, uh, as much as I used to. But when I when I do go and sit and play this is an game, intervention <laughs> actually. <laughs> We're <laughs> <laughs> no, it's funny. Like right here, like we have like the old like simulator, like the old like like the NES simulator down there. So we just like play like those like old Mario games and stuff like that. And I just I fucking I don't know, like going back and playing like those retro stuff. But whatever, so, I digress. <laughs> so do I have like a good idea when I say like you don't seek specific inspiration, but you just subconsciously like tap into it when you're making something is that what you said basically like you're not right I, I don't go out with a, a goal in mind to recreate a genre or to uh, copy a certain director or anything like that usually my ideas they start really small and just simple so I did a short film backwards and it was all about just like a backwards day I dressed up as a clown I had a young lady dress up as a, a mannequin doll I I saw that. What, yeah. did, did it show in a, a local uh, theater? Yeah, Tampa Bay Underground Film Festival. I saw I was there, man. Yeah, That's yeah. awesome. That's I really funny. liked yours. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. And uh, it all started with one single idea I was driving, and I just thought of bringing a pile of ants to a picnic. Yeah. Instead of bringing food to a picnic, you just bring the ants already. You know what I mean? Because the ants come to the picnic. I don't know why. I just started, and I was yeah. like, so how can I? It, and that idea didn't go away. And I was like, okay, so I have to build on it now. You know, and it's probably similar to like a riff with you guys. Like, you know, it starts very small. So then it turned into, okay, I get ready in the morning. I get fully dressed and I jump in a pool. And then I'm at breakfast and I'm spitting water into my, into a cup, filling the cup back up as my wife is eating dirt out of a flower pot. (laughs) And then I pour the water in the flower pot and I get trash and dump it on the table for dinner and we eat trash and... It was like and, a tense comedy to yours. Yeah. It, it was like... It really, I mean, like, it's symbolic, okay? So the whole thing is that we eat trash every day and how we just get dressed just to drown and work. You know what right. I mean? So there's, there is... Yeah. It's so goofy and silly on the, the, the front of it, but there actually is like a... A deeper meaning. Yeah, societal it. symbolism, whatever, but, you know, artsy bullshit. <laughs> yeah, 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 there's a whole reasoning behind don't it. speed but. through that, bro. <laughs> yeah, but Express but it, it, it was interesting, though. But it starts with that simple idea of bringing ants to a picnic. So then how do I make a whole... How do I make a whole short film about it, you know? That's cool. So literally that little idea, like, spawned this, like, whole thing into it. Yeah. That's and tight. it's because I helped my buddy move, and he gave me an old wicker basket for picnics. Oh, wow. And I had it in the back of my truck, and I was thinking about picnics. 
Yeah. And I thought, I don't know why, but you I guess cloud. <laughs> <laughs> I thought ants at a picnic. How am I going to bring it in this wicker basket? That's just so. That's what's unique to artists, I think, is you can have all these uh, exposure to all this stuff around you, but not be influenced to create by it. You know, right. some people would see a wicker basket and not think anything of it. For some reason, I thought <laughs> it turned into a short film that consumed my life for three months. You know what I mean? Right, yeah. That's Are, so cool. Oh, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to mention that film uh, festival. I remember that older lady, too, that was a filmmaker. She had that, like, running poem with, like, the visuals at the same time. Do you recall Yeah, that? yeah, yeah, okay. She was so poetic. I, I wonder what her process was with, like, uh, inspiration, if she was poet first or, like, filmmaker first in that situation. She was some other type of artist first. I do remember now. I remember exactly what you were talking about. Yeah, I remember that festival, yeah. yeah. It was memorable. Yeah, yeah, yeah that, was, that was the whole... Because they do different blocks in festival, and that one's called like a, a film as art, or something like that. That's like the it's meant to kind of be abstracty, kind of artsy films. And hers was just just images with poems underneath. Yeah. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah, that's a great festival, Tampa Bay Underground Film Festival. Are you doing it again? Yeah. You think? Yeah, I'll have uh, my newest short film, Survival, is going to be there, and the documentary I'm working on is going to be there. In what, December. Yeah. December, okay. Yeah, beginning cool. of December, yeah. Nice, oh, yeah. I'll try and make it. Yeah, it's <laughs> great, man, because as a filmmaker, it's great to see it in the theater, your yeah. work of art, you know what I mean? So imagine if you made a song and you can only ever listen it to th through your cell phone. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's yeah. not the same quality. Yeah. You want that experience of seeing your work properly. And then also getting feedback and, like, the q and A. I I got to go up and people ask me questions right. and stuff, and that's always rewarding, you know? Yeah. After a show, you'd like people to be like, man, what was that lyric about? Or, you know, and I wish we had that. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> yeah. That, I'm like, man, that would be so cool to have. Or even just a riff compliment or something. You we know? do get yeah. that. I mean, people are yeah. nice when they come up and compliment your guitar playing or whatever. And yeah. 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 I do, but, you know, I, I care more. And it's nice. I'm gonna be, I, I totally appreciate it, any anyone saying anything at all, like even paying attention. But it would be nice to like for someone to go, you know what? Like that song, like I really dug that song for, you know, the lyrics or the melody or something like that, you know, because like, I feel like usually if someone who comes up to you and is like, oh, that that guitar part was cool. It's like, ah, you probably didn't like you probably didn't like it. <laughs> you, know? you just found something to say something nice about, you know what I mean? But I'm also being a pessimist in that situation. Yeah, you know? it's tough with live music when it's your first exposure to a song yeah. to really know how it affects you. You right, know what exactly. I mean? Like what are, what are the lyrics in a muffled speaker? Yeah. You know, yeah. it's just. Unless the sound is perfect yeah. and you got that vocal right out front, right. I don't understand 90% of the people live. You know what I mean? also don't do a great job of like projecting or rather what's it, what's it called when you're enunciating? enunciating. enunciating. Yeah. 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 I don't do it. But I, that's I've like bad, how you but. sing though. You know what I mean? Like, like, can you, can you understand what I'm saying in the song, for example? The song that you sent me or mm -hmm. live? No, the song that I sent you. And I'm, this is, this is on a recording. So right, right. Yeah. Some of it. Yeah, yeah. see? <laughs> I feel like it's okay, though. It's just, like, sometimes it weaves in and out of being an instrument, your voice, yeah. rather than, like, a vehicle of words. It's, what, the, it's the influence. Words. That's what it is. And it, it can be interpreted <laughs> that way, too. So I just did a music video, and uh, the beginning uh, lyric says, I've been watching you destroy me. When I first listened to it, I heard it as feasting on me for some oh. reason, just feasting on me instead of destroying me or whatever. And uh, it changed how I saw the video in my head. Because right. then I, now the video has a couple at a table eating like moldy food or whatever. You know what I mean? Because I saw feasting in my head. That, that was the image. I, but that wasn't the lyric. Right. You know what I mean? But I think it's, you know, my buddy who I told him, I told him that he's like, that's great. You yeah. Know? <laughs> I mean, it doesn't matter. You it know works, what I mean? It almost works the same. Honestly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You don't have to know the exact words someone's saying, you know? Right. You can yeah, still get the feeling for it. Exactly. That too. It's like that. I love when someone can kind of feel like where the song, like what the song is supposed to mean. Like, obviously I want everyone to have their own interpretation of the song, but like, it's cool when you can kind of like, Oh, this song feels like it's like a positive energy or whatever, blah, blah, blah kind of thing. You know what I mean? Like one of my favorite bands, ISIS, I don't know if you heard ISIS, mm -mm. not the terrorist group, it's the band, <laughs> post-metal band. Yeah, They're like Cult of Luna, Neurosis, like that whole genre. I don't know half their lyrics. I don't know what the hell they're saying. I right. still don't know. And I don't care to know. Yeah. They, the way they scream it and project it, it doesn't matter to me. It's emotion at that point. It's not even a word. Right. You know, right. I, I almost wonder too, like, cause there's certain artists where you can 
you can understand what they're saying, but you don't really know what they're talking about per se. And I like I think art taken in in that way sometimes is better because I feel like personally I don't enjoy music that's super on the nose, you know, because it's like there's not really it's much. country music. I yeah, kind of. <laughs> Nothing, yeah. I don't. There's some all right it. country music, but it is. The whole story is opening a bottle of Jack Daniels and drinking right. it like step by step. It is can be yeah. on the nose a lot. Yeah, I, I'm yeah. not I'm not necessarily a huge fan of that. And it's like honestly why I don't like a lot of like the Beatles early early stuff because it's just like you know it's just pop music. It's it's not there's nothing to me. There's like nothing of like real substance. You know what I mean? It's more like music to just dance to, which is fine, but it's not my you know it's not what I you want to think. Yeah, I want I want to be able to like go oh this song is about this for me you know what i mean well even what about have you heard of sigur Rós? yeah no they sing in an ancient icelandic language that nobody yeah. speaks anymore that's cool yeah. so it's literally yeah, really like a man they're really they're so beautiful high pitch uh, male vocalists and just kind of ethereal like chill that's I don't. Cool. It's like you're in Iceland, bro. Like, like I mean, that's what or Greenland or wherever they're from. But I think it is Iceland. But it's you know their lyrics. Nobody knows. You know what I mean? Like right. you'd have to look up and like translate and all that stuff. But right. they're huge. They were on The Simpsons. Oh, you know? for real? Yeah, they had an episode on The Simpsons. They're that's just, pretty cool. But they were able to make make great music. But you said you want music to make you think. If the lyrics you don't understand, then what's making you think? So Surely it's like, the tone. So. So the, the really the only example I can give are like uh, like Modest Mouse and like Radiohead. So like you can I understand what they're saying, right? But it's like I don't necessarily know exactly what they mean behind the lyrics. You get what I mean? Mm-hmm. So for example, like there's certain lyrics that Modest Mouse have where I can, I feel like I know what he's going for. And there's actually been certain instances where he ex, he explains what the lyric was about, and then you're like, oh shit, that is not at all what I thought it was. You know, I can't really. I can't think of any right now off the top of my head, but it's just like certain lyrics, like you go, oh, that's kind of like what I think they're talking about. I like, this is what it means to me kind of thing, you know? It, it kind of goes back to the wicker basket. You know, some people see certain things. So Kurt Cobain saw a teen spirit deodorant stick, mm. you know what I mean? And wrote a song about it, but everyone thought it was about teen spirit, right. but it was like literally about smelling your armpit. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, so, it, it, <laughs> But yeah. you can definitely enjoy. But Modest Mouse, does that does that guy have a lisp or something? Mm-hmm. Is that what I, I've seen yep. videos of him? Yeah, yep. he used to I do crazy that. live performances, right? Yeah. And like cut himself and. Yep. Like, yep. The one time that we saw him, I mean, not it's not that crazy, but like there was one time that we saw him where I think he like got a haircut like on stage, right? Ellie, was that what it was? He got like a haircut on stage or something. Modest, uh, Mouse. Modest Mouse. No. I just remember something like that happening and like he had like a coffee stain on his shirt and he was just like, <laughs> I'm ready to get fucked up. And we we're just like, oh shit, that dude. Was my buddy that song. Ah, okay, gotcha. And he started playing like his favorite song ever. He's like, this is epic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, we're not there yet where we would even think of doing anything like that, but uh, but yeah, I mean, hopefully eventually we'll, you know, we can get a little crazier on stage. <laughs> Cut our hair. Yeah. <laughs> no, I don't know, but I would imagine for like a touring artist like that, like you probably think of like ways to entertain yourself you know what i mean well yeah or management tells you how to entertain people and you have to go learn a dance for every song and you see the uninspired dancing of like taylor swift as you know it's just like you just let the people go out there and sing you know what i mean yeah i mean the thing is like with something like that it's they i feel like they want to put on like the best fucking show you know like they're trying to do both like everyone already knows the songs so now like let's also like take a hold of like the visual aspect and I do, you know, I, I, I respect that because I think like, you know, especially like someone like a Bruno Mars or something like that, where they have like, a, you know, they do a lot of like dancing and stuff or whatever. Like I can appreciate like it's a it is it's a it's a show. There's like a show of it. It's not my favorite kind of music, but like I know that if I were to go see it, I would probably at least be entertained. Yeah. You know, I don't know. It's does it. Does it take away though? You know, does it add or does it take away? That's I guess what you always got to think of. Like, yeah. are are you really adding? You know, to see th- four other people dancing in the same way, it doesn't do anything for me. I'd rather see like a Romstein show. Have you right. seen those guys live? They're, like no. chainsaws and flamethrowers and <laughs> no. like. That yeah. sounds like that sounds like it's a metal fun, band, though. right? Yeah, metal yeah. band from Germany. Yeah. I think though, like probably us four, 
we probably wouldn't be into that music anyway. You get what I mean? I like yeah. that. What did, uh, What's that? I've heard a few songs from them. I like yeah. them. Do Haas. Do. Do Haas, man. She fucking loves that song. That's <laughs> Romstein. Yeah, yeah. 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 Their she, live shows are crazy. She man. loves that song. Um, but for you guys, I could see a live show. It can still be entertaining and cinematic and not flashy. You right. know what I mean? You guys would just be like dark everyone has their own little light shining on moody. them yeah right. a moody type of vibe for sure yeah that's what you get you're saying yeah yeah a little fog in the background type that's of deal cool. you know you it's don't need all like the flashing lights and sh you know strobing maybe if you have faster parts but right. you know a low-key set you know that that can be engaging right that that low-key feel to it you know well th like for me personally i i like to think that our music is you know entertaining enough just because it's not like super cookie cutter i think it's in in some respect like relatively i don't want to say weird but like it's not like it's not completely accessible you know what i mean and and like uh it would be cool to find something visually that would like you know pair well with it i just we've had i've i've had a hard time figuring that out like you know i think creative loafing for the show that you ended up going to like basically tagged us as like a 90s sounding band and i've never thought of that before but i found it you know i was like okay sure like that's interesting <laughs> <laughs> you know? they probably heard the radiohead influence and you know right what, or, what was the band they compared you to there was a. Um, uh, I i said screaming trees right dinosaur jr dinosaur jr yeah, yeah. yeah. which i've never listened yeah to them. and screaming trees was the same exact time as them too that's like okay. the, in the same area and same kind of genre and right, stuff right. for some reason you you tickle that in people's brains that that have that uh, experience with their music. Huh. But that's cool to me. I've yeah. again never listened to them before. I'll I'll take it. Like any any as long as you like it, I don't give a shit. <laughs> <laughs> you know. No, they did a nice write up in there. Oh yeah, yeah it was yeah. cool. Very yeah. nice. And no, I appreciate the shit out of that. Thoughtful. Uh, before before it gets too late into the podcast, I wanted to ask about your um, current projects and what's like exciting you right now. Um, definitely this, this documentary on the hot dog party from Crowbar. It's exciting. Okay. Um, two years ago, I did a documentary, Two Weeks with Tom. It was like a 90-minute documentary following Tom to George around. And I was only two, three years into filmmaking, and I made so many mistakes on that film, and the audio wasn't good, and it, I, pull, I probably got, I went gray editing that film, yeah. you know? And then this one I'm currently doing, I learned from all those mistakes, so I'm real excited to see the growth you can yeah. put these two feature length documentaries side by side and just see in two years you oh, know I, i've stepped up a, a, the game here and that's, and cool. that's what's you. really that's exciting awesome. for me now is that i've invested a lot in the right equipment and i see the quality of my work just slowly getting better so you the and type like when like not paying for the cheap thing but paying for the thing you actually want now i am yeah first two years get the cheap thing get it's the cheap lights get the thing and it's man I, if i could tell anyone that's it just invest in good shit first that's what dan's been teaching me too because i was yeah. like getting cheap shit and he's like no just get the thing you want now so you don't have to pay for both <laughs> yeah yeah i have so much equipment like shitty equipment in my garage that i don't even use anymore because it was like some 40 dollar led light you know yeah and the, the current documentary the light i used was 470 dollars for one oh, light wow. yeah the the filter on it the umbrella filter was 120 bucks alone Holy just the filter shit. right but it's perfect the soft light you know what i mean it looks great it, it's exactly what i wanted my stuff to if you want your art to look or sound like how you want it to sound or look you have to pay yeah if you want a certain tone in your guitar you're going to buy that 500 dollars pedal you know yeah, what i mean it's it. just as how it is or you're going to be frustrated for a long time and i was frustrated for a long time where you see it i could see in my head and then i go to edit and i'm like fuck this is not what I saw in my head. How do I fix this? And, and uh, yeah. yeah, and now it's just the equipment is, is there. That short film you made held up well, I thought. I didn't think it was cheaply made at all. Uh, was that during the same time where you feel like you were cutting corners or? No, that helped. Uh, that was, it helped because I had a cinematographer on that film, oh, Jake okay. Whitney. Okay. So he, he operated the camera and did the lighting. And you were directing. Yeah. Okay. And I was in it. I was the clown too. So right. I couldn't, yeah. usually I like to operate the camera, but it was just impossible. I was, I was in clown makeup the whole <laughs> <Right>. time. <laughs> there, and that there's, was funny though. If you were there's, just, like, a, filming at the same time. there's a photo of me. Uh, I'm have the script in my hand and full clown makeup out back directing the girl what to do and stuff. Yeah. And it's just ridiculous. I don't know how I got through that day, but, uh, b but no, um, that period of time, I was slowly starting to learn more because that was almost three years ago now. 
but it, it was really the past year that I was I was just fed up with how things were looking, and I was just like I just wanted to be perfect. Yeah. Bought a new computer, got a new camera, new lights, new microphone, just completely just dropped six grand on a credit card and right. just said this is it. You know what I mean? Yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna make this my life, then I'm gonna just go all out. You know? And it's yeah. the same thing I said to myself five years ago. So I kind of went through this again, you know, where it's like, this is really what I want to do. So I'm going to invest in it. Yeah. That the honest truth is like, unfortunately, as fucked up as it is, like having good shit, it really does change things for you. It just does. Like, yeah. I'm sorry. Like having like a good guitar, having a good amp, all that stuff. Like it really does change like the sound. Like it fucking matters. You know, like I had a, my first guitar it wasn't a bad guitar at all by any means. It was an Epiphone, which is like a lower grade of like the Gibsons, basically. And it sounded fine. Like I could probably still use it right now and it would sound okay. But like the difference between that and the current guitar I have, like there's just no, like the way it plays, the way it feels, the way it sounds, like all of it. Like there's just no, there's no ifs, ands, or buts. You know what I mean? Like it's just. It, it, I mean, I, artists or painters, they even have paint brushes they like. And you know, it's. I do some painting and you go to Michael's there's $30 for one paintbrush but it's because it's got that horse hair it's the you know it's right. gonna give you the best outcome and yeah you can find hacks around shitty equipment you see it on YouTube all the time right. especially with video like how to film this and that and but at the end of the day if you look at a, at a movie or an album the credits of what it takes to make something like that it takes people and money and equipment and you know yeah. you, you want everything to be professional then you need the professional stuff that's yeah. just yeah, th yeah no, th i think that is the decision of artists like do you want to be a musician or a professional musician right you know like do you want to have the pro gear or do you want to just play backyard gigs it's you know yeah and that's kind of like what we're getting into now like having like the space and the studio and stuff like that's definitely the next step for example is like getting like you know outboard gear and all that shit, better mics and whatnot, you know, like, it just is what it is, bro. Like, there's a limitation to having, like, the kind of shit, like, basically having, like, a bit, like, a starter pack of, like, equipment. Like, there's a limitation to that, you know? Once you, like, put some money and effort into the things, it's like when you start getting, like, the different sounds, the different tones, like, you get, like, an actual, like, I don't know, warmth, that, that, that those kind of things, like, all that shit adds to it, you know what I mean? Yeah, I was thinking about that on the way here, actually. I was listening to the radio, and it was like lady gaga poker face came on and uh i'm actually a lady gaga fan man like but those type of productions are so layered with yeah. sounds if you listen to those like lana del rey her music is so well produced i think the guy i forget his name now he's in the black keys but he produces a lot of music you listen to it, you can hear 12 different tracks of just like little intricate sounds yeah. of production and it's like that it's not overproduced but it's produced to the gills it's filled yeah. with production yeah. and you don't notice it the first listen and it's kind of like films when i first watch it you kind of gloss over things but then when you when you're alone in a quiet room listening to this music and you can tell this producer spent so much time on each little sound you know yeah there's definitely tricks to the trade like i forgot what i saw recently oh it was like a tip on like instagram or something it was like um if you want to beef up your snare hits, you want to it's like add claps on one and three. <laughs> like it was like some shit like that. And I was just like, you motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but it is, a, it, it's the, it's the reality. Like personally for me, like when it comes to like recording music and stuff like that, like I love clean, like I love clean and like layered sounds, but like I try to get it to sound as close to like live, but just like done in like obviously like a recorded fashion but like close to live as possible you know to where if you listen to us live and you listen to like a song of ours you'd go oh shit like that definitely that sounds exactly like them you know what i mean like with equipment and all that shit we use yeah. the same equipment with the band i mean i think that's necessary because you don't want all these random sounds like unless you have a sampler unless you have a dj right. guy dj guy sampling sounds but right. I'll see pop bands live, like on TV, and I can tell, like, yeah, you're running three tracks through a through your drummer right now to get all those mm -hmm. different guitar sounds and yeah. stuff like that. Yeah. So let me ask you. So you've done a few music videos for people. So what what got you into doing that exactly? The music videos, mm -hmm. uh, doing the stuff with Achilles, who was rapping. Okay, so that was yeah. the, kind of the beginning of that. Though. Yeah, and I mean, my ultimate goal is like short films and stuff, but music videos are fun, man. Right. They really are, like. It's a good combination of uh, 
me be, me helping someone out out with the video and then also my own artistic vision right you know because it's kind of like the the band comes with the script and then i direct the visuals for it right you know your lyrics is the script kind of so when you're making that for example then you're not necessarily pulling from like an inspiration of like previous like directors of music videos or anything like that you're just kind of going based off of like the way that you make stuff yeah does that make sense yeah definitely definitely okay. it always starts with just listening to the song and then what daydreaming just daydreaming yeah yeah okay yeah because I want because it, it it must like that's a weird thing. It's like I guess the only comparable thing to music would be like a band going, "Oh, I want to record with you guys. Like this is our sound, and can you help us get this kind of sound?" You know. Well, maybe going to a producer. You kind of say that if you go to a producer, like, "Hey, we have all these songs," and then the producer can change the sound and interpret it. Like Rick, Rick Rubin did it with Lincoln Park a couple years ago mm, and stuff. You right. know what I mean? Like. You know, it, it's it is weird being collaborative, but also having no say, right? Right. I can't change your song. You know what yeah. I mean? Your song's your song, but we have to collab on it still. You yeah. know what I mean? I do feel too like a music video can really like set the vibe for the song, even if the song already exists on its own. Like visual, something visual attached to it, I feel like it just adds to like the vibe of it. You know? And and it it shows showcases the artist too and their vibe and what right. what they're about another great example like lana del rey 90 percent of her videos have some like old film look to it you know what i mean because she just likes that old hollywood feel you know right. i was actually going to bring up the old film thing and what you thought about uh the retro fad right now like leaning into the grit of the old filmmaking do you vibe with that or are you kind of trying more clean I, uh it just depends on what is called for yeah it's like anything you know what i mean if it's supposed to take place in the 70s then i guess it makes sense you know but you're not just gonna throw a filter on that has like the uh, vhs kind of look to it no or... <laughs> i've done that before though i did it for for a, a music video it was kind of like a they were playing the song in a practice space and then it was them hanging out so i wanted to make it feel like a home movie yeah. so yeah. i put home movie vhs screen on it you know what yeah. i mean so like it definitely had its purpose but the the retro look, I mean, that's been going on forever. They, in Citizen Kane, they did flashback shots with older looking lenses. You know, it, it just depends on what you're going for. Yeah, you're right. But it's just yeah. easy now. Because right. you just, Easier. I get, try to get sold presets all the time where you just drag and drop it to make your footage look grainy or look this way. And it's like, oh, that looks cool. You know, it's like Instagram yeah. filters. Like, oh, it looks cool. You know what I mean? But I guess at the, the end of the day, music it... thing made it feel like a movement really is what I refer to. Like how YouTube is, you know, there's so many lo-fi playlists now and, you know, it's just a genre. Yeah. yeah lo-fi yeah, music. And yeah. <laughs> I listen to lo-fi beats all the time. Yeah. yeah. Lo-fi beats focus. to study yeah, to and too. stuff. Yeah. yeah. Got to study. <laughs> no, I'm, I, yeah. I mean, it, <laughs> and there's a science behind it. I just watched a video on the whole how they build those tracks and they use uh something jay dilla helped start where it's not synchronized exactly yeah so you know there's uh quant quantizing yeah. yeah. is that what it's called where quantizing it, yeah quantizing it's anti-quantizing where uh you know a lyric might come in just a half beat off time and stuff like oh. that so it so, keeps your brain more active so you're not lulled into that all the time That's sometimes it skips a little or sometimes it's yeah it's off it's yeah. crazy yeah it's like science in like <laughs> and it's a mistake but is it you know what i mean like right it's... yeah um are you familiar with portishead at all oh yeah yeah for so sure. like their third album they um which is my favorite of theirs like they really focused in on like real simple parts but also like offbeat shit like literally like one noted like synth like notes or something like that or like bending it so it was like a little out of tune nice and like it's so to me like it's so cool like the way that they did that shit like i'm like it, it like it, it definitely inspired me like even in like me vila for example like there's that one part where that where the synth is just going like bing 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 you know and it's like not in, intentional like, yeah it's intentional like the first chord is not like it's technically not in that chord but then it like lands on the chord you know like shit like that like i i don't know i just sorry i just de no no derailed what was it, the name but, of that album dummy um dummy and also portishead 
was a third one was like the, the third one is actually called third <laughs> oh, okay yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I had to visualize that in my head yeah yeah dummy is their first one and then portis head is their second and then the third is third yeah but yeah no sorry i just thought of that because you were talking about the uh, quantiz- quantization so for the video i'm doing for you guys uh, no grainy look to it do you not want to do the old fame you showed me you wanted the clean uh naturalistic look for the uh for the characters and yeah, we still got to film you guys and figure yeah. out how to make you all look. But. Definitely have a conversation in front of us for sure. I yeah. want to talk more about it. Yeah, uh, wanted to hear what you had to say, and your ideas. Um, I'm cool with an old look. I'm cool with uh, letting you run with the visuals too. I really enjoyed how you handled panda pause video and. Um, yeah, that was a fun video. I mean, yeah, after, cool after shit. now knowing that you did that short film too, that really excites me because. That stood out in my mind when I watched it, and I know that you're capable of like something more surreal now. And, yeah, and yeah. With that's Panabals, my specialty. <laughs> see, I think surrealism what works with our music because it, we have like, we like we like to say we have a psychedelic kind of right tone. So leaning into that would be fun. Yeah. Or yeah. Uh, uh, I don't know. We could talk about it. Is that your favorite genre? Like in general, like what would you say is your favorite genre of like film or whatever? I don't know. That's tough because I, I, I like all types of films. But definitely stuff that's uh, a good word is uncanny. That has an like, uncanny feel to it that doesn't quite wrap up. You know, there's no clean conclusion, really. It's, it's, it's a thinking film. It makes you feel certain ways. Like 2001, A Space Odyssey or okay. A Clockwork Orange. Like, so, like, Kubrick's great films, but he had eight different genres. Right. He did a war film, a horror film, you know. So it's so it's hard to like say surrealism yeah. is my favorite, but I think I tend to lean towards that. Uh, and I actually I talked to Tyler about this when I did the panda pause video because he was saying like uh, it's not quite making sense to me. This I was like, listen, don't think about making sense. Think of it as a dream dream state. You know what I mean? Right. It doesn't in a dream. I, I'm sitting here and then I blink my eyes and I'm in my bedroom. You know what I mean? Like it doesn't, there doesn't have to be logic. That's, yeah. That's you know, it's, it's interesting. <laughs> it's freeing. That's a yeah. Free it, it's dream. Yeah. David Lynch calls it dream logic, a type of thing where it's, if, if you, you would, as, if you establish <laughs> that your, you know, logic is what you establish it to be. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Within the film, you know, so it's like if you establish that it is a, a dreamy film, then people are going to accept a lot crazier shit to go on, right. you know? So I would say dreamy films are my favorite. I love that. That's so <laughs> yeah. cool, man. Like, I, I mean, I, I fuck with that so hard. Like, I feel like that's also like the way I, you know, think of music, you know, that's, 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 and I personally, like the movies that I like are like ones like that, for example, you know, I actually haven't seen uh, uh, Odyssey yet. 2000. Yeah. 2001. <laughs> yeah. I have not seen that one yet, but I've obviously heard so many, great things about it and stuff like that but that's definitely one like on my list turn off all the lights yeah, yeah i was gonna close see. to the tv yeah <laughs> watch it that way real quiet real loud <laughs> loud on the speakers quiet everywhere else yeah no it's, it's dynamic it, film it brings you in and you know it bombed when it first came out society didn't understand it you know they really? didn't it took all the kids taking a bunch of acid to go watch it <laughs> and it it got re-released and got popular but i it, wonder like for him i wonder if if I wonder how he perceived like that people would take it in, you know, like, I, I like, did he think, oh, kids taking acid are gonna be like the ones that enjoy this, for example? I think no, he probably didn't give a shit. Well, I, well, I would say everyone makes films or art for it to be enjoyed. You know what I mean? Nobody right. wants their shit to flop, or right. nobody wants it to. Especially, he was given so much money by the studio at the time and everything, but he he co-wrote it with Arthur C. Clarke, who was the top scientists at the time about space travel they went through it was like inception or not inception uh interstellar Interstellar. they went through vigorous vetting of trying to make it as realistic as possible they he wanted it to be a sci-fi film that was real all the sci-fi films beforehand were these goofy aliens these crappy spaceships landing with strings and stuff like this you know it was made in 63 i think or 64 so it was he wanted it to be taken seriously and when it first came out everyone said that it was boring it, you know, it, 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 that they couldn't get the story. There was no famous people in it, and they really shit on it. And it took open-minded kids dropping acid and getting stoned, and then the word of mouth, and it and it expanded people's consciousness. You know, people's lives were changed by that film. Like, what greater feeling 
<laughs> to know that That's he changed crazy. people's lives. He changed cinema with that film, you know? Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah, and uh, but initially he was pissed, I'm sure. Yeah. You know? Yeah, he's probably like, oh, he's fucking kids. <laughs> he's the only people that like it. No, I doubt it. He probably was like, I'm sure he was stoked that anybody was digging it, but that's that's funny. Yeah, that, that's, it's, it's, it's interesting to go into a, some sort of like creative po- process with that mindset of like, like, I want this to be liked, you know, because you do that for, you know, you kind of create for that reason. I feel like some people, I don't know about everybody, but at least, at least for myself, I do. And uh, when you don't get the proper reception afterwards, that must be like such a blow to the fucking, you know, to the ego. And yeah. And does it make up for it that later in life he was so recognized? You know what I mean? Or does it almost make you bitter? Like, where were you fucks when I was bombing at the theater? You know what I mean? Probably, like, honestly. It, you know, I think you'd be a little bitter about it. Like, I mean, I'd say he probably didn't even give a shit because of how eccentric he was as a person. I feel like he would just hold himself up and wrote all the time, you know, with. The way he worked, he was just always moving on to something way more ambitious next. Yeah, something yeah. completely different. So if that bombed, then he, you know. Well, right after uh, 2001, he made A Clockwork Orange. Yeah. So 2001 was like a $20 million budget, which in today's time is like $100 million, right? Right. A Clockwork Orange he made for like $1.5 million. Oh, wow. They shot it on, it was called a, a college light set. Whereas if you went to college and studied film, they gave you like three lights. He said he wanted to be as bare bones as possible. Yeah. So he did that on purpose. I well, it's kind of like you know, to he was so tired of all this research and all these huge sets and you know dealing with all this stuff that he he just went to the opposite direction. Just simplified. It, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's like okay, so you know, I made a twenty million dollar sci-fi. Now I'm gonna make a low budget, uh, apocalyptic kind of futuristic film. You know, right. and he just, I think he rebounded with that. It was like for his own self, you know right. what I mean? Like that's, he's like, well, fuck it. You know, I'm not going to risk anyone's money. I'm going to just do this little thing for myself. Yeah. That's super interesting too. Cause it's like, like, I feel like, I don't know, you, you probably are getting to this point too, where you're going to like, you know, have like all the fucking equipment that you want, like have the best, best stuff and then get to a point where you're like, oh, I've done this already. Now let me like, let me like bring it, like, let me simplify it like somewhere, somewhere in like a similar light, you know? Yeah, definitely. No, I'm already... I want I, so badly. I want to go film uh, next to Ebor. They're tearing down all these uh, Section Eight apartments, so it's all gated right now and empty with mattresses all out, thrown, spewn everywhere. And it's like two city blocks. This really? apartment complex. Yeah, I just want to go get my camera and film a rap out there rapping. No lighting, no nothing. You know what yeah. I mean? And I just bought all this lighting and all this, and I just want to go do this simplest thing because I guess it's just uh, it'll still work. Right. You know what I mean? Yep. Yeah, I have, yeah, you have all the greatest equipment, but at the end of the day, if it works, it's going to work. You, right. know, you don't actually, you don't have, calls for it too. Yeah, yeah, you don't have to throw that $500 pedal on every single song, you right. know what I mean? No, yeah, I think like for recording, in, in, the, in that sense, it would be like stripping it down to like one microphone, like on like a room mic or something, you know what I mean? <laughs> like using like a shitty mic. Actually, MF Doom did that for, uh, for a lot of his uh, like actual like, his, I guess his vocals, you could call them for his rapping. He would use like a shitty mic nice. to record it. Yeah, so it'd like give it that like weird fucking like. Sounds like it. Yeah, when he raps, like it's a uh, man. It's not underground, like low budget, but not. Yeah, kind of. Yeah, like lo- almost like lo-fi, like almost yeah, like lo-fi, yeah, like yeah. vocal shit. Yeah, yeah. It's 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 funny too how like those things happen where you're going for that particular sound. Like especially now, for example, like I don't know. I think a good example is like a maybe like Mac DeMarco when he first came out, you know, like real yeah. low budget sounding. His stuff. videos too were low budget, grainy looking. Yeah. And it's great like, though. You it's, know? it's crazy to think that like that turns into like what's like popular. Yeah. So then people like put a ton of money into looking like that, yeah, you know yeah, what I yeah, mean? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like so funny to me or sounding that way or whatever it is. You know what I mean? Like it's just, it's just wild. Um, so let me ask you then what, what artists, do you really, I guess, like, who are some of your favorite artists? What art? Um, I would what? say, I, I guess, music I, I, I was referring to. Music, uh, favorite band's Tool. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Cool. That's, Hell yeah. I didn't read you as a Tool person. Yeah. Well, listen, cool. there's a lot of Tool people that, you know, don't look at. Well, there, and there's, because <laughs> it's a, there's a, a, a wide range of Tool fans. I went to the 10,000 Days tour at the Amelie Arena back in the day, and... There was the range of nerdy-looking dudes to metalheads. Yeah. You know, it depends what album you're into, yeah, I guess, right. you know. 
It's like Grateful I, Dead. Yeah, I like uh, Anima. I like that album into Lateralis, so the more psychedelic, like, you know. And then you, when you go back farther, it's more angsty, kind of straight, like rock metal type of vibe. But I don't know, Tool, I think it just, they have that good combination of uh, the sounds that take me to a different place and then what he's singing about. And I can hear him very clearly, too. Right. Like, you know, Maynard's really good at, at singing well to where you understand every word he's saying. And they're not direct stories or anything, but for some reason, I just really, the, them coming together to it, just the, the lyrics and the music. That's know? cool. And lead singers is tough. Like, I'm, I'm not, I love rock music, but half the time the lead singer kills it for me. Right, you like know? the way they sound and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's tough, man. I feel like the vocals are like such a huge part of like an artist for me, for example. Like, I know, I'm not a huge, I don't typically like a vocalist that sounds generic. You know what I mean? Like, I honestly, I sometimes I prefer someone that doesn't sound perfect. Yeah, you know, but has like a unique voice. The Mars Volta, man. Yeah. Like I should hate that guy's voice, but right. I love that music. Like I love it, man. Right. Like, yeah, it's cool. It's it, unique. Yeah, it's different. Yeah. You know what I mean? My buddy came back from one of their shows in Orlando, and he's like, "Man, you gotta listen to this band. The chick can sing so good." <laughs> <laughs> I've heard that several times. He, yeah, he saw them live and thought it was a chick the whole time, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, his ha- fucking high ass fucking. And he was pitch. wearing tight leather pants and like a midriff shirt and stuff on right. stage. Yeah. Yeah, going back to like the the different language too. Like they released that album and like. Like, I think, like, a lot of it was, like, in Latin or some, or, not, was it Latin? Yeah, I think it was, like, old Latin or some shit like that. I don't know if you know what I'm talking about, but. No, I'd have to hear it. Yeah, it was. So I download everything, like, illegally, so it's, mm-hmm. <laughs> I, I don't necessarily yeah. know what my albums, you know That's what I mean? old it's just school, man, LimeWire, My bro. Napster's <laughs> hooked up right now. Three days, three days for one song. Damn, that's crazy. And then it's a virus. <laughs> <laughs> I'm protected, though. Um, so you've you've pretty much lived here your whole life, right? Yeah, yeah, born and raised. What what would you say, like, how, I guess, how do you perceive the music scene from when you were younger to, like, about now, basically? How do you think it's changed in your... The music scene, I wasn't much a part of it, but, like, 16 to 19, I was going to a lot of, like, low-key punk shows around here. At the time, there was Transitions Art Gallery at Skate Park of Tampa that was having, like, great, great bands were there that I were really into from Georgia, Kalisa, Kalesa. I don't know mm-hmm. if you heard of them from mm-hmm. Georgia. There's a several bands, but uh, I wasn't in the scene. I didn't know, but it felt like, wow, there's, there's like, Matt and Kim. I don't know if yeah. they're doing gas. They did Transitions Art Gallery. Before they blew up, they were on, like, MTV a few months later, but... I didn't get a feeling for the music scene, and so I started doing videos around okay. town and stuff. And I started in the hip hop scene, right. so I saw you know the hip hop scene was was slowly building. There was this guy, this guy currently Mike Mass, he still raps around here. He had just been on uh, Sway in the Morning, did a whole freestyle talking about three coins and stuff. Oh shit! Sure. So that brings spotlight to Tampa. I think uh, it, the music scene it's it's not stagnant, right? But I haven't seen anyone break through yet. There's so many talented people. That I'm, and it's just like, I talk to Tom DeGeorge about it often. Like, what does it take? There's a band, Have Gun, Will Travel. Great band, great music. All the guys look great. Uh, they've had their music on TV shows and stuff like that. They're, and it's, but they've never broken through. You know what I mean? And they can't, they don't know why. You know, like, it's just, what is that? It's fucking luck. Yeah. Yep. You know, I mean, right that's place, right time. Yeah, dude. And, and, and is Tampa the right place at the right time right now? You know what I mean? So we're waiting for someone to come into Tampa to notice Tampa. You know, that yeah. that's what I feel like needs to happen. But uh, it, I, I think I think my only issue with that is like I get what you're saying, because I think like once there's some sort of buzz like around a city, I think more people are prone to coming over here and kind of like you know maybe signing them or whatever but i feel like that's that's very like that's in the past i feel like i feel like nowadays like a band like like the one you were just referring to like i feel like nowadays you kind of have to build your audience on your own you know what i mean and then kind of like branch out that way be successful that way because i i I know not a ton of artists but i know a few artists that you know they make a living off music and they're not like huge names or anything like that but you know they they don't have a day job for example and they know how to use social media yeah right yeah so but bringing that back to tampa locally and this is no knock on anyone or any promoter or any venue but where are the paying gigs around here where are the good paying gigs you know a lot of the venues that i frequent they you know they'll give the band 100 200 bucks 
when you're a, a four or five person band, everyone's yeah. getting $25. What are you, you know, how do you, how does that become sustainable? You know, so it's, it's not so yeah right no it's so for the music scene it's we want musicians to be able to express themselves but if it's oversaturated with a ton of people then i think the good ones get lost in the mix maybe yeah you know i think in the scene itself i can agree with that i do think like the scene that we have and we're pretty new to it being from miami but i think we have a pretty awesome community of musicians and stuff like that it would be nice to see some, you know, like we, I think we talked about this when, when we first met, but like see someone kind of make it, you know, cause then it kind of puts a spotlight out here and whatnot. But I, I, I really feel like, uh, people kind of have to build their own success now. It's not. So I agree with you 100%, but it's then it's not even build your success locally. Yeah, right? right. So the local scene right. isn't important then at that, in, the, in that regards, you know, it, it is, you can build your name with having fans in other places. I mean, a terrible example, great, like Takashi 69 He was huge in Poland before he blew up in America. Oh, really? He <laughs> toured in Poland and stuff and was huge there, man. Damn. Huge, yeah. And then blew up over here in America, you know? So it's, it, it's just, it's different for everyone. Yeah, you know. There is no path, you know? There is no. Just got to forge one. Yeah, yeah. Well, you just got to keep creating, yeah, right? Yeah. yeah. Just don't yeah, and, don't and give up on yourself type of your deal. Path. And, and hope that, like, more artists continue to, like, create and, you know, make bands or whatever or, you know, keep creating art and whatnot. But, yeah, that's <laughs> that's funny. To, uh, Poland, like, of all places, like, that's so random. <laughs> now, there's a heavy underground hip-hop scene there. Oh, really? I think Little Peep did, too. Little Peep toured Europe before he toured America because he oh, was so shit. big over there. Yeah. It was because the SoundCloud stuff. That's why oh, SoundCloud right, right. was big. Is big in Europe, Eastern Europe, huge. Right. So SoundCloud rappers get their start kind of in that Eastern European block of like ex-Soviet cities type of deal. <laughs> right. Yeah. I, I wonder. Like that's you know, it would be nice to live somewhere where the majority of people care about music, but I just I don't know if people in this country care about music like that. You get what I mean? Like, I, I just feel like that might be, like, an, like I feel like the general population, they're kind of force-fed the music they listen to. Yeah, I absolutely. Don't know, I don't know if you agree with that. Absolutely. But. And so, ideally, these uh, companies like Spotify should help smaller artists, right? But I don't know, because still the top artists they promote are Drake and Taylor Swift and stuff like that, you know? I think SoundCloud is a, was a good option. You know, right. Chance the Rapper started on SoundCloud. There's a lot of... For rappers, Dat a lot. Piff. Of, <laughs> or is it, is it Dat Piff? Was that like underground website that like you download a bunch of mixtapes from? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah. You're like you're on some it. some dark web shit <laughs> there, man. What do you do? I promise it was the black web. <laughs> that's where I saw Chance the Rapper the first time. That's why I bring it up. Yeah. Or Bandcamp. Yeah, you gotta like go yeah, to those Bandcamp. third party ones yeah, that those. aren't so known. Definitely SoundCloud, I know for a fact, like, that was huge for, like, hip-hop artists, too. And honestly, like, I feel like that's another thing is, like, I feel like those genres of music tend to have more listeners than, like, rock music. I, I don't even know if rock music is, like, super prevalent right now. There's a tons of articles, and it, it's, you know, when was the last time there was a guitar solo in a number one hit song? Hasn't happened in years. Has, you know, uh, rock music has died out, and it's become, you know poppy kind yeah. of you know what i mean like actual guitarists aren't needed anymore yeah. but the music's there a good example is rihanna's album anti has the guitarist i can't remember his name now amazing guitarist though and he plays guitar throughout all the songs and oh, it's cool. freaking great yeah great guitar licks and everything but it's mixed into the pop music right you know and so it's rock is like yeah there are no tools anymore rage against the machines or Right. Like, like there's no new upcoming bands that, you know, like a ton of people are watching. You yeah. Know? Yeah. It's all like I feel like all the like the big artists like that, you know, like whatever rock music, like they're all from like the 90s and like behind. You, you know? too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like the only the only new band I can think of that's like huge is like Tame Impala, you know, but like even then they're pop. They're like super poppy. And I like them. Don't get me wrong. I love them. I think they're awesome. But yeah, they uh, they like got big off of rock music, and then they slowly started going more into like synth pop, you know, going like sounding like that old school seventy. They from Australia, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. 
So I just, I don't know. I don't know if, I don't even know if we're in the right country for this. You get what <laughs> I mean? That's kind of my thing. I don't know. I feel like that's too cynical. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're in the right country, man. At, <laughs> or where we need to be. At the end of the day, though, the question was, you know, uh, what do I think of the music scene? Where, so in the past five or six, it's been great. Tampa, I've never, every day almost there's something going on musically. Right. You know what I mean? I've never been a need for something to go watch. You know, as, as low key as the shows can get, those are the best ones sometimes, you know. You know, you can go and actually talk to people and meet people. Uh, you know, not everything has to be a 400 sold out room. Right. You know? Yeah. Is there something similar in like film? Like, is there kind of like a scene in film here? Or? There is. Uh, there's like a clique of people that all kind of know each other and they all been doing it for a while in Tampa, but it's not real. You just tolerate each other. Yeah. <laughs> well, they intermingle and earn each other's films and stuff. And But there's, it's not real. I'm trying to find the right, right word. It's not super organized for one. And it's not the most, man, I, I can't, it's not the most like professional setup all the time. Orlando has a lot of commercials. So Orlando has a lot of more production companies and they're kind of set up for it, has a bigger film community. But really it's, I mean, I don't know. It's a bunch of people doing this, the same shit. It's a bunch of horror movies. It's, yeah, it's really kind of repetitive and I don't know. That's, that sounds terrible, but it's not something I'm interested. Like I'm not trying to get into the Tampa Bay film scene. I make films in Tampa, yeah. yeah. but it's not like I'm trying to get into the film scene because right. I just don't think it, it would benefit it's, where I'm trying to go with my it's more vision. like you're honing your own craft. Yeah. In yeah. the place you are, you just happen to be here. Right, right. Okay. Yeah, it's it's but it's you know, there's not venues to play your films at, so right. it's it's hard to I'm surprised you're at the what brought you to the film festival? I was actually in one of the films. I was in uh the Mannequin Dreams one is by my buddy Zachary Aberisk. Okay. Yeah. I do He's remember like a weird that. Who was the director? What's his name? Zachary Aberisk. Yeah. All right. I'm is trying that... to think. There was someone else in it though. Um was there someone else involved? Oh yeah. Uh Luther was the other actor. Yeah, he was there as well. Okay. Yeah. No, I definitely remember the mannequin on the beach. Right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> it was, yeah, it was fun to make. Uh, cool guy. Um, See that? See? He's over at Full Sail now. Do you okay. have connections over there? No, but anybody? that's like Orlando yeah, in that right. direction yeah. and stuff. Yeah. yeah. Well, I do uh, the Have Gun World Travel. Ed Stork, he teaches at Full Sail. Okay. He teaches cinematography there. And I know Ed a little bit, but uh, but like so I don't know. I guess is he part of the film community? Your friend in Tampa? He moved out there, so I think he's starting his own thing out there. Yeah. So yeah. That's it's tough, man. Like, mm -hmm. the film communities just don't really exist unless you're in these major hubs. You know. That's interesting. I I I, I didn't even think of it until now, but I was just wondering, like, yeah, because that, that I guess like how would you even like. What you would, I guess, have showings quite often. Like you would just have showings at like the places. Film festivals, yeah, right. just the local film festivals, and then it's not a guarantee you get in, and you know, it's, yeah. <laughs> gatekeepers, bro. <laughs> yeah. No, but um, but no, that's that's interesting, and uh, I think uh, we're almost at the hour mark here, so uh, oh, we're past it. All right, well, I guess uh, I don't know. If, <laughs> did you have any other questions, Jaren? Well, um, you could find Michael Sinclair on Instagram <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> You just go by your name on there, so I think it's pretty easy to yeah, find you. Yeah, Michael M. Sinclair, yeah. And do you have a website as well? No. Okay. No, I, All right. I get asked that question a lot, and I don't know. I, it's I don't Instagram. Don't it. It's Instagram, yeah, no. yeah, or YouTube. <laughs> you just, I have a YouTube channel. You, yeah. you, you accept DMs for requests or whatever? Yeah. If, okay. Yeah. 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 You could find majority of your work on Instagram and probably YouTube. You up to it as well? Yeah. YouTube okay. has all of my films and stuff. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Check them out. Yeah, check them out. Guys. <laughs> and thank you for uh, for doing this, bro. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Appreciate it, man. It's been a pleasure. Peace.